Okay, so I've got the long lengths of timber to do the frame jams and the styles of the doors. I'm going to plane these up and see how they hold up, make sure there's no woodworm or rot or, or any imperfections or they, they don't hold up to size through them being a bit bent because they've got a bit of a bow in them. I've just sort of turned them opposite each other here to show the extreme of the bow. So it's about 6-7mm on each piece and we've got, we've got plenty to spare, we want a 60mm finish and we've got, we've got about 75mm thick timber. So we should be okay in terms of getting it straight. I just want to plane these up first and then I can cross cut the rest of the timber and get the rails and all the panels out of that and not be short of a style if I need another one. So if I did have a problem, I've still got the big piece of timber to be able to get another style out if I need to. Right, so after a bit of head scratching, we've managed to get all the bits that we need for this door and this frame. So over here, I've got some big lumps that I cut out after I did the door styles. So these are the biggest parts that needed, which were the panels. So I managed to get one full width here that will just need deep ripping on the bandsaw to make the two panels. So they'll be next to each other in the door. And then all of these ones are out of a single piece or a single length that I ripped down at just over half the width of the finished panel. There wasn't any more timber available that would do a full width panel, so I've kept these in, well, they will be in pairs, and deep grip them again, and then book match them together to make the panels up so that the, the grain within that individual panel is the same. And because they're all from the same tree, we can keep two pieces next to each other in the door so you've got a matching pair within the door so it should look quite good and not look like a, a mismatched bit of grain within the panel. That's the plan for the panels we'll leave that for a little while until we tack them we'll get the door sort of made first but we know we've got the timber ready then just everything else is laid out so we've got the five intermediate rails. These need to be a touch thicker based on the drawing because there's a mould both sides so We've got a 60 mil door style and top and bottom rail, but the intermediate rails, so the, the horizontal section in a door like this, they're called intermediate rails. They need to have slightly thicker section size to keep the part that's left as a flat the same as the styles and the rails. So we've got roughly 50 mil left as a flat after the moulding. As you can see here, so this section here on this pattern piece that we've made up part that's left as a flat is roughly 50 mil. We want that to be the same on these intermediate rails so we need to add the extra thickness of that moulding cut there onto the timber. So these are going to finish at 70 mil instead of 60 mil and the same with the vertical parts of the door here. They're called a muntin so on a window frame the vertical part like that is called a mullion and they would be transoms but on a door frame they're either mid rail if there's only one or it's intermediate rails if there's several of them sort of repeating and the vertical section in a door is called a muntin. Yeah and then top bottom rail and I've got a, a few frame head and sills there because one of them's got quite a nasty split in it but it might be hidden in the bottom rail or the sill of the frame by the skirting board that's going to run through at the bottom so you might get away with that one. I've got a spare one here that's equally got a split in it from the sort of the dregs of the timber to see if we could perhaps use that so that one would look quite nice here it's got sort of a nice little feature knot 
Um, and again, the skirting would run underneath here. It looks quite clean on these faces, so we could probably get away with that bit as well. So I've got a spare piece there because we're going to be hand cutting all the joints. I've got a good selection of pattern pieces over there to do some test cuts on, etc. So you always want to get a few pattern pieces out if you're making a door like this. So I've planed up all the door material now and we'll move on to setting out. Okay, so now we've got the material planed up. It's always a pain planing up like that. You, you tend to always struggle for size or there'll be a split in the wrong place. This is sort of a very unique piece of timber, English oak. I've got a sort of limited supply of it. So it's a struggle to get exactly what you need out of the one piece. Particularly this time, I've, I've really had a, a bit of difficulty getting the pieces out without too many splits and stuff in it. So I'm glad that's over and done with. I managed to do it, I think. I've got a bit of a, a runoff on this top rail of the frame here, but we are rebating it away. So you're only going to see about 10 mil of that. By the time I've cut that to length, we're just going to lose that and it'll be on top of the frame anyway. So I'm just going to lose that bit there. There's a little bit of worm holding just on this corner. We should get rid of that. And there's a few tiny little ones on the back. We'll treat this piece before we do any staining or anything to it to, to kill that off. And it shouldn't make any difference to the finished piece. So, like I say, I've struggled a bit to get the timber out for this. We got there in the end. Similar thing with the bottom rail here. Like I said, we've got this nice little feature knot. We'll try and keep that in place and hope it doesn't get lost by the skirting board that sits in front of it. And the split at the bottom here, again, will be lost in the skirting board. So I'll just label them up as a face and an edge. So we've got a face here at an edge, and this is the sill or the bottom rail. And then we've got the head here. This is for the frame. So we're going to run that little bead profile along there, like this, along the insides of the frame before we joint it together. And then once it's been jointed together, I'm going to do as per the existing cupboard and run the bead around the outside as well, like this. So it's like a double bead profile all the way around the frame. The existing cupboard actually has the, the grain of the uprights running through, so this is an upright piece. It runs through like that to the top of the cupboard, and then that bead profile physically runs across the top of that piece of timber there, so it's cut into the end grain and it meets in the corner. So we're going to have a bit of fun. I've got to mould this in afterwards and stop it short of the corner here, and the same across this end grain, got to mould it into that, and then sort of hand finish this corner here into a sort of a mitered bead shape so that's going to be quite interesting i can't quite see because all the ends the grains broken off on the existing one whether they've just run the, the molding through from both directions and had just a little bump in the corner or whether it's been made to look like a mitre so i'm going to do it like a mitre and try and hand chisel and carve that piece in but it's going to be a bit interesting with the end grain as well but at least we have got a practice piece on this because the bottom of the frame is hidden by the skirting we can have a, a bit of a practice on this section if we want to or on a pattern piece we've got plenty of them too so we've got a good option to to get get a good finish on the joint there so there are head and a sill or top and the bottom rail whatever you want to call it and then we need just two uprights for the frame as well so i've got the four long legs that i've planed up for the two sides of the frame and then we've got two door styles as well so the uprights along the edges, so frame, door style, door style frame, they're the four pieces I've chosen. They're all long enough to do either a frame or a style section. I've done that on purpose, so if one of them's considerably bent or took a bit of a curve while it's been thickness, which it can sometimes do, I can use one of the frame pieces instead of that piece if it was designated for a style and I wouldn't have a bent door because the frame pieces can actually be screwed straight when they're fixed into the opening, whereas a, a door is sort of, you've got a bit of help with the hinge side, but on the latch side it's, it's reliant on the timber being straight. So I'm just going to cast my eye down each piece and check that they're all fairly straight. A very, very slight curve is nothing to worry about. It actually can be slightly beneficial sometimes in a door. 
but they're all good. They're all fine to be, be used as a door style. If you stack them together, look, we've got barely half a mil gap at each end, which is pretty good for, for oak on such a small door style section. So you can use any of them for, for the style. So we're really down to a choice on what grain we want where. So I'm just trying to decide whether I keep it sort of with a bit of a grain match against the styles. So when we look at the drawing here, whether we have this frame section matching the grain of this style section, so it looks like it's been intended to be cut from the same piece, and again over here, or whether we just go for a completely random look. Let's see if we've got two matching pairs for a start, and go from there. Because of course these have been cut from the timber in this direction, so originally in, in the piece of timber they were like this, so to match them as a pair, you're going to have to open them out, sort of like a book match, almost like that. So you've got to try and find where they've been in that piece of timber to get them two pairs. Now you can look at the end grain and sort of work it out from that. They're the two pairs that I'm going to use. So these are my door styles here, these two, and these are my frame pieces. So I'll just label them up quickly, just check up on the length on that one. 1736, because it tapers off here somewhere. Yeah, got plenty on that. So if I label up the frame and the door styles with a face mark, I know where they're gonna be in the finished piece. I will make this end the top, so I'll put a top mark on all of them. And then these are my door styles, so they're gonna need to oppose each other too. So we've got two pairs, a pair of frame, a pair of door styles. And we know exactly how that grain is gonna finish within that frame. When we're setting out this frame, we can actually use that setting out to define the exact positions height-wise on this door style as well, so that we know that if we've got absolutely perfect grain like this piece here, it wants to match up really nicely with each other when it's in the finished position. We can set that door style out from the setting out on the frame and we know that it will end up in that position when we come to fitting it. We'll lob the door out of the way for now because we're focusing on the frame for a start and uh, we can set that out. As so always just have the two faces opposing each other clamp them so that we're marking out on that edge, the inside edge of the actual frame. Much the same principle as if you've watched any of the other setting out I've done. We're looking for any imperfections and we're just going to look to mark them out out of the joinery so that we can try and hide them if possible. Let's have a look at this drawing. I've changed my mind slightly on the sizing that I've detailed on here because I was originally going to, on the top rail section or the head of the frame, I was going to rebate that out the same as the style so it sat around the plaster work. So this is the frame section, so the styles at the side of the frame are actually sitting on the face of a, a sort of a corner bead of plaster, so I'm going to rebate that out fairly deeply so that we've just got about 10 to 12 mil of timber left there and fix that around that corner of plaster. So that's the plaster work. We'll have a bit of a gap and that will just sit on the face. I was going to do the same in the head to give it a tiny bit more height but I've actually decided to reduce it down just to sort of a maybe a 7 or 8 mil rebate like this just in the head and that will give us a nice strong joint in where the head meets the jams of the frame because if we rebate all that out there's this whole section here has got no strength whatsoever so um, just, a, just a small rebate there um, and it will help that uh, a bit of machining we've got to do on that top detail there as well, having that backing and strength in the joint. So that's what I've got to do. So I've got to adjust this height of this frame to suit my measurements that I took from site, not what I've actually drawn out here. Site measurements, don't know if you've picked that up on the screen, but generally I'll just cast a cross line laser into the physical opening and then measure the points that you want to take a reference from to that laser line. So. If you can stick it in the middle of the doorway or as close to, that's ideal. You've then got a perfectly level line horizontally and vertically to check any measurement. So we want to put our frame in level. So we're measuring from that level line, which is a square reference to where the frame will be, to then points on the wall which the frame will intercept. So from that line 
to this corner I've got 318 mil and then from the line to that corner 349 if we go to the bottom of the frame you can see that's been reduced to 342 so if we wanted to pick a frame that's going to fit in there perfectly parallel without planing any off we've got to go to this 342 figure but if we want to fit it so it's tight all the way up with a scribe we've got to go to the 349 figure if we follow that onto the other side you can see it's slightly out of level in the other direction this way so we've got a 323 measurement at the bottom and a 318 at the top so if we wanted a frame to fit perfectly in that opening with the scribes so it's tight all the way up both sides we're going to be looking at making it 349 wide from the line that side and 323 wide this side so we know that if we add them two biggest measurements together we will have a frame that will fit in that opening once it's been scribed in place. If you just rock up to site and take a measurement across the width of the opening from there to there it's going to be too small to fit in once you've done them scribed so you're going to have a bit of a gap so it's a good method for measuring up and it's what I've done here so the same in the height so we've got that horizontal line from the laser we can see that it's only one mil out of level along the top it's three mil out of level on the bottom so we can add them two measurements together and we know what height we can make this frame all right so instead of doing this off measurements because we're filming it and trying to instruct you in, in sort of a, the techniques of bench joinery let's do a rod drawing and it's a, a cross-sectional drawing of the item that you're going to make. It's very important to set out your joints and know exactly how it's going to fit within the project. So going off, I'll hopefully get a screenshot of this. Going off this drawing here, mark our laser line on there. So 646 to the lowest point on the floor. So 646 on there and that is to our cross line laser horizontal line so we're working out the height here so from that line we've got 11.30 to the underside of the plaster work on the opening so we'll mark 11.30 on there going from 100mm so we've got 12.30 and we mark it off the 100mm move down to this end and tick it off here at the 100mm so that is the measurement there is our plaster line so we're going to square that over and we can even write that on if you need to as a reference point so and this is the opening of the frame that we're making this side of it so I said we want to just slightly rebate the frame over that so it's only going to need need five mil maximum doesn't really need that to be honest but we'll do a five mil rebate over the top and then we'll actually rebate the frame by probably seven or eight mil and we know we've got a little bit of clearance there to slot it in place then we've got a 60 mil top to the frame so we can mark them points on so that will be our frame now if we travel back down to the bottom, so this is our floor measurement here, so this is the lowest point of the frame. We've got a 95mm skirting board, so we want to see, I'm going to say around 20mm of frame, so if we look at that as being the bottom rail of the frame, or this side for you guys. We're going to have a square piece of skirting board like this and we're defining now how much of this frame we want to see so I think just just enough to nick over the top of that skirting is, is going to look great just so it looks like a really nicely fitted cupboard so if we go around oh, what's that measure I bet that's about 18 mil something like that should just look like it's, it's nicely fitted to sneak in above that skirting board there so let's have a quick measure of what that's looking like yeah 18 mil so it's about double the, the width of that bead there at, at 9mm, so just just looks right. So we'll we'll measure that 18mm. So let's set that out. So we've got 95 to the top of our skirting. And then we want to come up 18mm from that point to our frame. So we can square that line over. That's the the top of the bottom rail or sill of our frame. We can then mark out that piece of timber at the 60mm. 
that is the position of the bottom of the frame here. So we can now measure from this point here to this point here, this one here, which is the top of the frame, and that's our overall size that we need to set out to. So as we've already set out on this rod, we can use that to physically tick the lines over from these respective positions that we want to reference on for our joints. So if we look to this top rail here, we can just tick them straight over and without moving the rod or the timber, tick the other end and we know we've got our setting out absolutely spot on. Now we've got them two tick marks, I can square them across the timber on that inside edge. Give my pencil a quick sharpen. So that is how the bottom rail will join in like this. At that position there, we're going to be housing this piece of timber back in the stiles on this, this face edge to create the house joints here. So you mitre this section away and you do the same on the long grain coming down here. And then that's your, your joint that you have in this section here. Right, so I've just cut the head and the sill off to length. So we're having this beading, bead moulding here that is 11 mil in depth there. And then on the head, we've got a, a six, seven mil rebate out the back there. So they're the only things that can affect the joint we're gonna put in this top and bottom rail. I'm going to use a domino this time. It's it's not much difference between using a tenon and a domino, but for the purposes of this frame, I'm going to just stick a single 10 by 50 domino in the center of that joint there. So I'm going to go between this section here and then seven million where that rebate will be and put the domino in the center of that for the top rail. And then in the bottom rail, it will just be in the center of the, the overall of the timber. So set at 30 mil. the rebate on, find the centre of that, so let's go 26 mil, just lob him in there, same both ends, mark him from the same face, that's our domino position, and then on the bottom rail we'll go 30, and we can put the corresponding mark on the styles then, so the bottom style here, we can either use the actual piece and we can physically tick that across on each section, so turn it around so it's going to be the appropriate piece, or we can measure it. But either way, we've got a tick mark there to work from. Same on the other end, so this is the top, we want the head of the frame, a line of two face marks, so the edges are on the inside, and then we can just tick them marks over, or set them out from that measurement. And if we square them lines around, give us a nice visual reference point for the finished parts of our frame. So when we're gluing up, we can align with these, these two lines, and that is our domino the reference line. Okay, so we'll stick a domino on them lines. In the styles, I'm going full depth, 28mm, and then I'll go 20mm into these, these rails. And that should just give us enough, I'll go test push together. It's not quite enough, I'll nip it up to 25mm deep on the rails here. Depth wise, I'm just going right in the centre. So these are 32mm thick, so I'm going to go to 16mm. I was originally going to do a proper mortise and tenon on this joint. There's not a lot of difference in it in terms of strength, but the timber I've got, I run out of length with imperfection. So I only had about 20mm extra timber left on the length I was going to use for these rail sections and that would have left bugger all tenon basically. So I've ended up using the domino. Like I say, there's not a lot in it strength wise. You're still going to get a pretty strong joint either way. Okay, so the next thing to do is to cut this beading profile into the inside faces of the frame. So we're not doing the outside yet, just the inside. I've got a little bead cutter for the router here. You could use a spindle molder cutter to do this, but I'm going to be using this for the outside as well. So I'm going to use the same cutter for both things, so I want to keep it consistent. So I've got this in my little bottle router. I've used this one over the corded one because you can change the speed on this. It's quite a big cutter and in the other router it tends to, to vibrate quite a lot. So I'll turn the speed down and we'll just take a nice smooth cut with it.
Perfect. Absolutely perfect that is. What a beautiful little router. It's good as well because it's got a, a clear base on it so you can actually see what you're doing. It stops instantly. It's nice sort of ergonomic to hold. Dead easy to find adjust on this, this collet ring here. It's a bloody, bloody impressive and good bit of kit as well. Right, so now we've run them moulds through, we've run it right through the styles and right through the rails, all on them inside faces, so you can see how the joint's going to sit together. What we need to do now is to mitre this moulding part here so that they, they sit together. Now if this was a shouldered tenon, so if there's a tenon sticking out here, you'd just be mitering this shouldered part and not the rest of it, so the rest of it would be a, a different shouldered tenon. So probably not worth talking into, it's just going to confuse the matter, but one shoulder would be set back from the other because one shoulder would meet this point here on this edge, then the shoulder on the back would be meeting this uncut edge, so you'd have sort of a rebate on them shoulders. But for this style and method, we're going to be cutting the entire width of this section here through at that point there, so exactly on that corner there where that moulding meets the shoulder, we're going to mitre that through there at 45 degrees, like that. That's the easy cut, we can do that on the mitre saw or a uh, guillotine if you've got lucky enough to have one. But this is this cut slightly harder. Again, you could we can cut it on the mitre saw to a certain depth to get to our point that we need to and then we need to just clear this material out at this exact point here, perfectly flat across that joint. So that is going to form the basis of our joint. So that's going to be dead square across that timber at that exact point there to get a nice, nice finish on it. So that's the tricky bit. There's various ways of doing it. What I'm going to do is set a gauge from this face to this line here, mark the back edge, cut it very near on the bandsaw, take this piece out again, quite near with a rough cut of the handsaw and then just use a chisel on a, a jig to pare this away at 45 degrees. If you're if you're not got a jig to do this, uh, you can make your own, just rebate a piece of, of chunky timber to sit over the width of this piece here and then cut it on a mitre saw at exactly 45 degrees. If you're doing lots and lots of these and you've got a really accurate saw, you can set up a end stop there um, that you can butt your piece of timber up to if they're all the same size. Set it up and it will just cut that every time to exactly that point. If you've got really wide joints or wide technical timber, you could set up a router table or a spindle molder cutter to rebate exactly along this line and get a nice sharp square cut as well. Let's just set this gauge up. We're roughly. Oh no, wrong one. A bit confusing. Let's have a look. You can get a nice little Morso machine that will notch this for you. So it's a guillotine, but it's got a like a flat tooth on the front of the mitered guillotine plate, and uh, you set this depth here, and you mitre push it up to the plate, it'll actually chop a flat section away of the timber there, so dead handy bit of kit if you're doing a lot of beaded face frames, uh, that's the bit of kit that you want to buy. For me I just mullock along doing them by hand when I have to do them, try not to do too much. Okay so we'll chop that out with a bandsaw and then hack this bit off and then we'll finish that mitre cut by hand. So the finished joint, when it goes together, it's going to look like this. And to get to this position, we just need to rough chop out that mitre. So I'll do that on the mitre saw, and then we'll pair it back to our exact cutting. You can, of course, cut this off by hand. 
with a tenon saw or a cross cut saw. It's just as easy while we've got the saw set up. You want to be about one mil away from this finish line. You can use the saw as a finish cut, but I find it's dead easy to, to get a bit of an inaccuracy there and end up with a gap in the joint. So I always just go slightly away from it and finish up to it by hand. Back the remainder out of that gut. Be dead careful not to go beyond them extremes of that joint. You want to be a want every cut to end, land perfectly in the corner of that mitre. At this stage, I just pair back to this shoulder here, and we've got a very faint groove line in the back edge we put in with that nice gauge. We just want a, a dead sharp chisel and it wants to be perfectly flat across that joint to them two shoulder lines. So we just pair across, working across the grain like this into the centre of the material. Keeping that chisel dead flat and not, you don't want to dig into this edge whatsoever. If your chisel's not sharp, this is a waste of time. You might as well just spend 10 minutes just sharpening your chisel because you're not going to be able to do this nicely um, without sharp kit. Like I say, every chisel cut just wants to go just deep enough. You don't want to be hammering that chisel into the timber and creating a, a cut mark because that's going to show up in your finished work. So turn that round and work from the other side. That's just a very faint line and a nice cut on the bandsaw there. We've just got a wafer thin section of material here that we can just nestle the chisel in, so the, the tip of the chisel there, and we can just work to that line, keep it nice and flat and work our way along, and that'll give us a perfect square shoulder to put that rail up to. Need a set of uh, good eyes for this job. Get them specs on. So you just got to keep it nice and flat. The perfect joint will be dead flat across the two shoulders. So them outside points perfectly flat across. You can cheat a little bit and just put a slight taper on it into the middle so that the edges are nice and tight. But if you want absolute perfection, it's got to be nice and flat across there. Like I say again, you're just cutting into the corner, no deeper. Just when you need your sharp chisel, because you'll hear the fibres of the wood cut rather than smashing through the chisel. Just move that along a bit. But to cut this mitre up to this line, I just use a jig like this. So, so something with a rebate in it here that I've uh, mitered on the saw at 45 degrees. You can buy aluminium ones of these as well, but uh, I've always found making your own is just as good. And you can get it the right width for the piece of material you want, and if you get a thicker piece of wood, you can have more of a chisel stop along here than the aluminium ones provide. But we just sit this up to the line we want to pair it back to, or just, just beyond it, clamp it in place. If you're really good, you don't need to clamp it. You can get by with just holding it and doing a quick pair to that line. It doesn't take long when you're well practiced to pair up to this line. I would, for a start, get used to just clamping it down in place. It's not gonna move then. And it's just a case of very carefully working back to that flat surface. So again, sharp chisel, and we're just pairing that grain down to the edge there. On this front edge where the beading disappears back on itself. You just want to be really careful. You can either slice in it a bit of an angle for the for that part there until you get to the rebate or just make sure your chisel is dead sharp and cut straight through. You don't want to be having any breakout on this edge here because you'll see it on the joint. So we're just loads of pressure and keeping that dead flat. 
and again we're just cutting into the joint perfectly on that corner it's a bit like letter carving you you don't want to go any deeper than absolutely perfect from the other side oh my nose is going for it today <sighs> took steep there but the camera's a bit in the way <laughs> there we go, we've got a nice clean joint there let's go have a look, see how it looks Okay, so top rail and the top of that style, so we've got the exact fits that are going together. Pretty good fit, it just wants a touch more taken off it, so we kept back from that line ever so slightly with the jig. So we just want to advance that jig along this rail a little bit more and fully take this line off and then everything will line up. Have a look now. Oh yes, this is nice. So you can see how important it is now that the joints get together not to cut into this corner. If your chisel is extending into this piece of wood here and leaving marks, it will dig in here and show a little nick mark. And then when you put that together like that, you'll see where that pencil line is, a little nick mark in your timber and it just looks horrible and unprofessional so it's really really important that that chisel line between there and this 45 degree just stays nice and sharp in the corner. Okay so repeat that for all four corners and we'll have a nice little frame to put together. So that's the four joints done on the face frame. So these uprights, the horns here, so the bit left on is called the horn, will get chopped off flush with the top of the frame. And then I've had a little play here with the finish we're going to do on that. So we're going to have this beaded profile that I've got to sort of hand carve around that corner. So it doesn't look too bad, it's not too hard to do either. So I'm fairly confident. I can get away with doing that, especially with a slow speed setting on the router. Try and avoid these burn marks, you can sort of get quite carefully into that corner. So that's the detail I'm going to go with. Had a bit of a play with running it round on both edges, but it looks a bit too gothic for what we're going for and not in keeping with what's there at the minute. So that's what we're going to go with when we've glued the frame together. Before we glue it together, I've just got to sand these inside edges and sand this mould moulding here as well so being careful not to touch this sharp edge here that makes up this joint just sand this profile through so there's no planar ripples or router marks in that oak there so the last thing I'm going to do before I glue up is I've set out here some 12mm lines, so two sets. It's for a magnet close or the magnet catch. So the frame will intersect at this point here on this corner, and it's a 60mm or style on the door. So I've just come in a couple of mil or about 10mm from that point, so the magnet will sit in the top rail and not in the end grain of the style. And I've marked them 30mm apart. I'm going to just mortise a slot in the back of this rail so this is the inside edge where the moulding is I'm just going to mortise in from the back here 12 mil and then lines like this now I can sit a magnet in there like that that will form the basis of the magnet catch so on the, if this was the bottom rail on the cabinet from the top it would look like that excuse the mess that that's just left on there so you wouldn't see any interference in that grain no holes drilled or anything 
There will be a board flush with that top edge there that will form the bottom of the cupboard. So the cuts in from the back there will be hidden. But there is actually a magnet hidden in there. So when the door closes above it, you offset them very slightly and it will pull the door into the stop. So you've got a completely hidden magnet catch within the frame. You can't really do that any other way. The only other way you can do it from the face is if you peel a bit of the grain back and then drill a hole and then glue that grain back down. But that's not quite as good as doing it this way. But you have to do it in advance to get this in mortiser. So we'll offset them out. I'll just quickly mortise them through now. Now this isn't the best mortise chisel that I've got. It came with an old mortiser that I bought. The first mortiser that I bought came with this old chisel. It's a bit rusty and old, but I've never used it before now. But it seems to cut all right, and it'll do this job. So it's handy to have it for this type of thing. Set the depth so that the magnet will go in about about 18 mil to the front edge. That's more than enough because it wants to be slightly offset from centre towards this back edge. And it's about about a mil and a half from that face to the edge of the chisel and I'm just going to take it really carefully to try and avoid breaking that edge. There we go, as close to that edge as you dare to get really, so the closer they are together the stronger that magnet pull is going to be. I've got two in here in case one isn't enough for this size of door, so I can add a second magnet in and get double the amount of pull on the door. So just wide enough for that to slot in and I can then just back that in with some filler with these magnets stacked above so it's nice and tight to that edge and just pop some filler in there and let it go off and that will hold it in place nicely. So check both of them. Yeah, nice. It's free, but not too loose, and it's not too big a hole, so that's perfect. You can use a bigger mortise chisel if you've not got a narrower chisel to suit the magnets. You just need to make yourself a little wedge with the thickness of the magnet cut out, the same size as the hole, and just tap that in so it supports the magnet up to the top, and just glue that in place. And then you can just shave that off with a hand plane and you'll have a nice sort of oak plug in the back of this. So, same on the other side, make sure you've got a pair and this is all on the opening end of the door so you need to know which way your door's hanging. You don't want to do this at the hinge side. I'm just going to set these in with the filler so that I can avoid grabbing the frame or something by this edge and just snapping it off there because it's quite delicate. So I'll put the magnets in now. I've got a little jig here, which I've had since day one of doing these magnets. It's, I've written on it frame magnet, so that is the polarity that the frame magnet will sit in. So every magnet I've ever set has been set off this jig. So if I ever had to replace a door or anything like that, I know exactly how the polarity of the magnet will be in that piece. So this is the replica of the frame. So we're doing the frame side. So the magnets will sit like that. So when they attract, they go in and they sit like that. And then when you're doing the door, obviously your door will be opposing this piece, so they will go into the door in the opposite direction. So, like I say, every magnet I've ever set has been set with this jig, so I'll keep to it. Mix up a bit of filler and just glue them in place. Now this filler is about a golf ball size amount of filler to a garden pea size amount of hardener is roughly how I would describe the ratio. And you want to get it mixed in really nice and thoroughly. Like I say, these aren't seen because the bottom frame section has the cupboard in front of it and the top section will have a little bracket holding the stop that's stopping the door. So let's scrape a bit onto that front face but not too much. Just want it to stick to the magnet so it holds that bit of grain rather than just having a dry fit between the magnet and the top of that piece of timber. So 
frame frame magnets are going to go in like this so we'll slide them off put them in place wiggle them about a bit get them nice and flat try not to pop it out the hole like that then we'll back him in with a bit more filler and just leave it slightly proud so that it's proud on all the edges you're going to sand off and slide the magnets away in this direction so it doesn't pull the filler out and the magnet with it it's probably advisable to put a bit of masking tape on the top there I'm going to have to re-sand that where I've moved the magnets over and it's got a bit of iron filings on it because that's quite an old set of magnets so probably best to put a masking tape across there and then you can peel that away after you've glued it on frame along that top there we want to get that nicely in the bottom I'm just checking here visually but we want an even gap from the back of the piece of wood there to where the holes to where the magnets sit because we need to set an offset on that against the door so got to be quite accurate with that around three to four mil offset so it pulls constantly while it's sat against the stop so you don't want them all in different depths this way across the timber they've got to be pretty accurate there you go you'd never know there was a magnet in there at all and it's time to glue it up so i'm using a pu glue this time my reps changed from the old company to this new construction chemicals company and they said this stuff's flying out the door so I've bought a box of it to give it a go and so far it seems to be pretty good stuff. It sets bloody rock hard to be fair and it's quite quick too. This is actually I think the 5 minute version and they do a 30 minute which is what I ordered but I think they've sent the 5 minute because looking on the website it says 30 on the half an hour version. So does set pretty quick I'll give the 30 minute a try next time if they can get it to me but so far so good I've found the transition from sort of traditional glues like cascamide and PVA type bond type stuff to PU quite difficult really for a start I found it hard to to sort of apply found the glue clean up a pain really and just never was that confident in it really but as time's gone on I've learned some sort of techniques really in, in application and just make sure you're really prepared for a glue up beforehand and don't start gluing up and then realise you need to get your wedges out or you know you've not got your clamps ready or something as PU's not forgiving on time and also there's a certain stage when it's going off that you can clean it up just a bit easier than if it's fully gone off especially with this this wood weld stuff it seems to go off so hard so quickly if you if you glue something up and leave it till the next morning to clean it up it's a bloody nightmare to try and get that sort of swelled out residue glue out of all the joints it's set so hard it's like a you can't even get a chisel, sharp chisel in it it's just just fights you all the way there is a point at which it's drying where it's sort of still just just sticky it's pretty much set so it still it holds a bead but it's just got a bit of stickiness to it if you start pairing the excess off at that point it makes a little bit of a mess of your chisels but it seems to be dead easy to clean up and you don't really get any residue sort of spreading because it's it's just set enough to stop it making a mark on the rest of your timber from sort of spreading it around if it was runny but it's not hard enough to prevent you being able to physically remove it like easily so it's a bit of a sweet spot and they're all a different timing but just keep trying it until you till you get to it I'll try and capture it on film when I'm removing it but that's definitely helped and just knowing where to apply it really and not get too much I've put plenty on this end grain here because I want it to hold well but it, it does tend to soak up the end grain quite a lot like cascamite would but what you'd find with a cascamite joint is you'd coat all your rails on your door um, all the shoulders like I'm doing here the end grain so 
anywhere there was end grain on a shoulder, you coat them up with cask mire and really layer it on. And by the time you've sort of coated that rail up and put it in the door and then coated all the other parts of the door and got it assembled ready to put that last style on in place, you'd look at the shoulders and they'd be completely dry of glue. And you'd end up re-coating them with a, a load more cask mite. And all it's going to do once you squeeze that joint together is squeeze all the glue out of the joint, soak up that end grain and it just makes for a weak weak joint in my opinion. I've seen join relieve the workshop where he used to work, glued up with cask mite. Um, the joints would be cracked before they've left the workshop and it's just not good really. It's, you know, that glue's soaked up the end grain, there's not really a lot of strength in it after it's soaked up the end grain and left a, a bit of a weak joint. Whereas this stuff, if you put sort of a thickish coating on the end grain there, it does, does soak up, but it doesn't, because it's quite a viscous consistency anyway, it doesn't tend to go ridiculously soaked into the end grain and completely disappear. And by the time it's sort of soaked up enough to disappear if it was going to, it started to foam anyway and expand. You physically got some glue there to glue the joint together, so I, I think you get a much stronger joint with the PC than you would on a cask in a situation like this. But I know a few old school joiners that still swear by the cascamite, and cascamite is bloody good stuff. And it's dead easy to clean up cascamite. You a bit of warm water in a bucket, you've got lovely clean joints in a very short time. Whereas this stuff can be a bit of a pig. Yeah, I've, I've, I've just I've just made the transition and I've got the choice of the two. I generally tend to find myself using the PU glue, to be honest, so that's what I would recommend. You've got to wear some gloves, be a bit careful of how much you get on your hands and where it goes. You know, you can get into a bit of a mess quite quickly if you get a bit on your hands and it gets on your tools and then you start touching your mouldings and your faces. Um, yeah, it's, suddenly it's spread everywhere. So, you know, it, I usually apply the glue uh, wearing a pair of gloves and then either swap gloves or take them off and then do any manhandling that I need to do. Try to keep them sort of edges and mouldings where it's difficult to sand a bit clean of any residue glue, especially if you're doing like a dye finish like we're going to put on these doors. You don't want any glue spots, you've got to sand them all out, else it will leave a, a light mark where the glue residue has been. Let's put that on with that one. Beautiful. I used to hate gluing up, but I've got a bit more relaxed with it now. I'm now more confident in, uh, in the results that I'm, I'm getting. It used to be quite a stressful time, especially on a big door in the middle of summer when the glue goes off, it's uh, quite heated. Get the clamps nice and parallel across the piece. You don't want them clamps pulling it out square, so you can try to get them in exact gaps away from your setting outlines. I'm just going to stick a long clamp on the joints there just to make sure they're dead tight up to their mitres. You can offset your uh, domino just to touch to help with that. Be really clever. That won't go too much because it doesn't go together. You can actually throw it out of square if you've got too much tension in a joint like that with the domino. You can throw that joint try and throw it out square and if there are one or two are different from the rest then it will throw the frame out of square with that bit of tension in places and not in others. There I always double up my clamps if you've got room on the outside or on the top side where the horns are. I stick another clamp on. Again, nice and parallel, so you've got a, you clamp both sides of the timber and it's not forcing it from one side. That piece of timber will tend to bow up with that clamping action, so if you've got one both sides, it will hold that joint nice and flat and straight. 
even tension across both clamps. You can back the first one off a little so that it's not clamped that one too much first and then you're trying to counteract it with this one. It's just an even pressure through both. Before I put the other end clamp on the top, I'll just check the square. Okay, so I use a square stick that looks like this, so just a, a stick of anything, a rod of anything, any piece of timber. Then I, I drop a piece down and taper it to a point and then that uh, engages in the far corner. You want the, the drop on the rod in case you've got middle rails in your joinery. So if there's a rail here, that will actually drop in that section and engage in the corner. If you just have a straight stick with the point on the end and you've got a middle rail, you'll never be able to, to get the square without bending that stick. So you'll need a drop on it. So we stick that in the far corner there, like so. Then we take a reference point from this corner. In this case, I will go where the two square parts of the moulding come together and just tick that point. And then we'll go to the opposite two corners. There and there. Make sure that point engages in the corner in the same place. And then we can just eyeball that tick mark down. What we want is that to be exactly the same as the other side. If it's long, so if the tick is beyond the mark, it means that side is short and you need to adjust your clamps or, or knock the frame so that it lengthens that length until it comes in line with the tick. But that is the best way to check a square of a frame. There are other methods if you're stuck, but anything involving squaring off these rails can be sort of thrown out of alignment by the fact that you're putting clamps on the pieces of wood. So if you put that clamp slightly nearer the inside of that rail, it will actually bend that piece of wood slightly inward. So if you then try to square off that part, you're not getting an accurate reading. Now that we know it's square, you can put a clamp on the same side as the other end. So if we did the outside on the other end, we'll go inside on this one. I'll just move that one across slightly so that it's a bit more even across the rail. making sure it's nice and parallel across the timber so it doesn't throw the square. And we'll put this one on without touching that glue joint line and making a mess of it nice and tight. And we can just run along, just check these joints are nice and flush. We've got a perfectly flush finish with a beaded face frame like this because you've not got a lot of sand in before you get through to that bead moulding. Right, so it's gone off to a stage, I think we're about there, where it's sort of sticky set. So it's soft still, you can move it, but it's set enough that if you move the clamps, it's got enough stitch in there to have, to have set. And that's the stage I like to start cleaning up. So it's set just enough for you to be able to, to chisel it off and remove it without too much heartache. On items like this, We've got a moulding, this is the ideal time to get rid of this glue. You've not got, it's not sort of too ingrained and set into the timber. So I'll just have a, a bit of a hand wipe to clean the chisel. And then just work my way around these joints. Dead sharp chisel, as always, these chisels shouldn't be anything but sharp. Keep it nice and sharp and clean. You're just paring it off at the surface where it's squeezed out and it shouldn't be too hard to physically do it. If you do this when it's set, you can't physically get the chisel in there because it's so set so rock hard, you sort of end up cutting your way through it rather than it just plying out the way like it is at the minute. And you're almost using your chisel a bit like a, a scraper to get into the joint and just scrape it off the surface but it needs to be absolutely dead sharp to be able to do that. And that's perfectly clean and at this point, no more glue will actually foam out of that joint. I mean, it's set enough that nothing more is gonna come out, but that was dead easy to clean off. I wasn't fighting it at all, so that's the perfect time. I'm just gonna quickly run around and clean all of them up while we're at that nice stage. I've took the tension off this clamp, it's just there to, to support it on the actual workbench. 
So look, it's it's still pliable. You now you could mould that into a into a ball, but it's not sticky. It's not sticking to my hand. So that's the ideal type. If you squeeze that, the centre of it will have liquid glue in it. I think you could, as you get used to it, you'll you'll find that time where it's ideal to remove it. Like I say, you just want to wipe just to keep your chisel clean. So every time you you encounter a bit of wet glue, just clean your chisel. That will stop it spreading. It's, the more you spread that wet glue around, the more it's going to be a pain to try and remove and sand it because it, it's a bit of a git, like the plasticky texture of it. It doesn't really sand particularly well. As it sort of squeezes out like that, it doesn't really stick to the surface either. So as long as you don't push it into the surface of the wood or the faces where it's not meant to be, yeah, where you've not applied it intentionally, it doesn't particularly stick that well anyway. So PU glue, if you read the spec sheets for it, does specify a pressured bond to get the right adhesion with it. So where it just sits on the surface, it's not actually producing a very strong bond. So you can get away with cleaning it off quite easily. The other bonus with using PU glue is that you don't get the black staining that you get from cascamite using the water. So you might clean that down with a bit of water and cascamite where the clamp sits on it and the glue. It all sort of reacts together. You end up with a, a black mark where the clamp and the glue were so across here. You're never going to get that with PU glue because there's no moisture involved. Lovely joints on that, lovely. Now I'm just going to use square the ends up or cut these horns off. You could use a track saw if you wanted. I'm going to stick it on the panel saw because this is nice and square inside. And it will just give me a lovely true square cut along the top as well. Run the sander over the faces. I've got uh, dead flush joints here, so you can't even feel a step in that. So I'm just going for a 120 grit for a start to, to ease them planar ripples out, and then I'll work my way up to sort of a probably a 240 grit, and then maybe a 320 grit if we wanted a bit of a, a nice shine and a nice touch to it. So I'll sand these back uh, when I've got my carpet pads on the bench. I don't want to do that just now. I just wanted to sand the face because I've got to run the bearing of the uh, router cutter for this bead moulding on this face here. So if you've got planar ripples in that face, when the bearings follow it, it will follow the ripples and it'll add the same ripples into the routed surface as you've got on the face. So it's just, uh, just going to save you a little bit of work sanding that uh, bead moulding if you if you clean the planar ripples before you do it. So that's why I sanded that off first. Plus you could we're running it across this joint too, so that wants to be nice and flat too. So we're going to have a bit of fun now trying to do this corner. I think the best option is to do these long runs in the vice and then perhaps clamp the whole thing to the bench and have the router sort of on its side and do it on the bench. So. We'll get these long runs done for a start. So in terms of stopping the router, I actually stopped the bearing somewhere here. Because the bearing, or this, this section of the cutter here, actually starts to eat into this speed part here that we want to keep. So you've got to stop it sort of quite far back from that corner to, to save that bit of wood from being eaten away. So I'm just going to take that measurement and transfer it onto both directions of this frame. It's about time to go home, but while I'm quite focused on doing this and uh, quite motivated, I'm going to get it done because it's not worse than coming in in the morning a bit tired and knackering up the whole day's work beforehand and setting yourself back two days because you've got to redo that day's work that you did yesterday. So we'll get it done now. Hopefully all will be well. We stop the middle of the bearing on them lines we should be fine so this is the bottom of the frame we'll just turn it around so that's our stop point 
for the top cut, and that's for the long cut. Same on the other side. I see there's a little bit of a nick there, and I, uh, I think it's just the heavy grain of the oak not split. Okay, so let's go for it. To take some of the error out of routing this bit, when you plunge it in, it's tending to grab a bit and just move a bit further or deeper than the position that you're plunging into. So just set up a backstop here that's going to work on the back of the router or router. When I plunge it in, there's no chance of it moving that way and I can just plunge it in quite quickly so it doesn't burn and getting to moving forward so that we're not going to get too much of a burn on this end grain. I can do the same for the stop cut as well, but I think I can judge that pretty pretty well. It's easier to stop a cut than uh, to plunge in and start one. It also leaves that element of the operation sort of, you've not got to think about it, so you can concentrate on making sure the router is dead flat against this surface. Then we just need to finish that off a bit by hand, so a bit of tool pawn. These don't come out very often. Oh, a bit rusty, look at that, nasty. These are my letter carving chisels. There's a lovely little fishtail chisel in here. That's perfect for uh, getting in the corners because it's got this edge to it, so it gets in really into them nice curved corners dead easy. But anything of a similar radius to this is what we're looking for to, to try and bring that moulding around the corner. We can use a, a hand plane for a start just to, to bring them in nice and straight. So we use this little Quang Sheng number set to a very fine, it's almost like a scraper setting. I think it's a 60 degree blade we've got in there just to, just to scrape them wood fibres away rather than let the blade cut into them and catch a bit of grain and peel it away we're just basically scraping the surface off and these are absolutely a, a joy to use compared to like a a record plane or something like that the, the difference is it's just unbelievable they're so nice This one, but we've got to work from this side, so we do the bit longer bed. See, we're just, I mean, that's what 10 passes, and they barely took the corner off, so very, very fine setting on the blade, very sharp and very low angle, so it's almost like a scraper plane. Just using the toe of the plane here to run on this surface to keep it parallel. Just give a tweak more cut. What we want is just enough, not too much. Let's use the body of the plane there to see how we're getting on. Got about half a mil to go.
about there. You can check the outside rounds just with a flat board on a piece of sandpaper. And get them in nice and nice and true with the rest of this using that flatness across this board. corner on that beautiful that's the easy bit done they want to be like it anyway normally but especially for something like this your chisels one of you want to have a good clean shave with your chisels so that you get really clean sharp cuts and you cut in the the wood fibers not so bruising them or denting them for actually cleanly cutting them grains of wood at a, just that individual grain level rather than trying to just force it to come out of the timber. So we'll just work our way into this corner. Even a lovely cut. Work them chips out. You can physically hear the the chisel cutting the fibres. That's what you want to achieve. Probably doing this all wrong. Comment if you're a carver by trade. And, uh, I should be doing it. I guess you'd use something like this and work into the corner. It worked for me on my sample piece, so I've gone with it. Any sort of well, letter carving that I've learnt. Well, I've not learnt letter carving. I've done a done a fair bit of it over the past few years. You never want to cut any deeper than you finish cut. Like I was saying with these uh, mitre cuts here, it's a slice into the exact position you want to go to no further. Especially if you're if you're using a wood die or something like that. Any cuts into the timber are just going to show up nastily. So on this section here I've, I've just tried to slice into where I think it's going to finish on this mitre point then I'm going to take this grain out so I'm just having a bit of a test here to see which way the grain is going to pull. If it's going to dive in I've got to start from this point and uh, work it out. Let's have a look see what it's going to do. And then again you're only cutting to where you think that mitre is going to stop. Don't go any further. If that piece of timber is not released, it's because you've not cut in further enough from the other way. Don't keep going until that releases. Then go back from the other direction. You'll end up with two stop cuts and it'll look awful. It's not playing ball that bit, so we'll cut him off sideways.
to do this for on the camera. Quite tricky. I can either see what I'm doing and not get my hands in there, or get my hands in there and not be able to see. Try and get that internal part really nice and sharp. So them last loop few fibres, just trying to cut them and not not pull them out of the timber. Like a touch deeper on that section. See what I'm doing it. There we go, I'm happy with that. Give that a bit of a sand up with the router, chewed it out. That is basically a brand new router bit. But, um, this oak is really dry. It's about 40 years old since it was kiln dried and it's stood in stood in barns and workshops since. So it's really dry to work with so any sort of cross grain routing like that there's not a lot you can really do to to help it so I'll just spend a bit of time and get that looking nice and smooth it's coming round it's coming round with a 240 grip <sighs> solves everything I'll leave it a week after it's been installed and see this joint move about an inch. <laughs> look at that, he says, look at that. I can go home happy now. I'll sleep tonight. Beautiful. That is really nice, I'm happy with that. And I'm sure you can watch this one in high speed while I try not to mess it up. I've marked the rebates on the back of the frame. I'm just going to cut them off. I was going to run them through the rebater on a spindle and set up a bed to support the frame, but I've got the VNHK kit for the Festool saw, so I was just going to give that a, a quick go and see how that performed on something like this. The end grain breakage isn't going to be affected because we've got a fairly deep rebate being taken out of this section here, so hopefully that'll clear that to the breakage from the end grain here from the exit of the cut. So we'll do the end grain first and then do the long cut down the length of the frame I mean, a couple of passes.
made a bit of a mess like that. I'm going to domino these two pieces of plywood that I've just ripped down to the inside of the frame. These are about 66 mil. I'm going to extend them down so that they sit on the floor. So they're going to act like feet for this face frame. So they're going to take the weight of the door, etc. And they're just going to sit in from both edges. So from the inside edge there of the frame, I'm just going to try and sit it back about five or six mil. I'm going to use a domino to joint that in and eventually I'll glue that to the frame and put some pocket screws in the back as well. But that's going to act as a foot so I can cut them off to the floor height that will take the weight through. But it's also going to act as a fixing point so I can screw through this past that plaster bead. So you'll have a metal angle bead in your plaster work of the opening. I can fix this to the frame and then screw through from this into the plaster work that will be here into a nice brick fixing and it will just hide them fixing so once it's been put in place glue all the way around and expanding foam in this corner where it all intercepts the wall nice and tightly so it's going to be completely solid we've got fixings through this ply into the brick and then on top of this once we've got all the fixing in place i will just laminate a thin strip of oak so like a five or three or four mil thick piece of finished oak, the same as the cabinet, on the face of this and you'll never see any of the fixings so it'll just look like a, a nice strip of oak at the inside of the cabinet. And it'll just help to, to strengthen this up as well because we took quite a lot of meat out of this face frame, it'll sort of act like a door lining so it's going to be nice and strong. I'm just going to mark some domino positions, domino this, domino the frame, put some pocket holes in this and then just dry screw it in place and then I'm going to take it and just do a, a bit of a, a test fit before I actually physically glue this to that frame so that we know everything's right. If I've got to take any more off these rebates here to get it to fit in the opening then I can take this piece of timber off and do it quite easily whereas when this is in place I'm going to struggle to, to rebate this out other than by doing it by hand.